This video is brought to you by Private Internet Access, my favorite VPN. The owner of the biggest dark web drug marketplace was an anonymous individual that lived in the USA and made a total of 614,000 Bitcoin in just two years by making a dark marketplace that was moving dope around the world at rates never ever seen before. This is the biggest mistake anybody has ever made on the dark web. It was so simple that if he just clicked one button one second earlier, he probably would have been a free man today. But instead, he's behind bars for the rest of his life, going on 11 years as we speak. He went by Dread Pirate Roberts online and was vocal about his libertarian views. He imagined publicly an online market free from all government control. So he began coding the biggest dark web drug marketplace, which was infamously known as the Silk Road. I've personally been on this site myself it, like over a decade ago with some of my friends we were trying to get spooked out to see what the craziest dark web sites were and we actually stumbled across this site and looked through it a little bit please don't tell the fbi and me but it seemed like unreal just imagine being on ebay but you find a listing for anything that you can possibly want there was different categories for narcotics for weapons for literally whatever you can think of they had on that site that you can purchase right there and it would come to your doorstep in the mail. These sites are legit, by the way. My friend actually showed me proof, like legit pictures of him ordering a substance online off the dark web. And I'm not gonna say the name of this drug, but basically it's natural from the earth and it makes you trip out. You can use your imagination. And the way that it came to his house was via a widely known USA mail company that delivers probably all of your mail on a day-to-day -day basis. The seller just sent it in such discreet packaging that it seemed like it was soil fertilizer. They put it inside of like little compartments and they have like a whole fake letter at the top like, hi dear customer, thank you for buying from our Etsy store. Please leave us a five out of five so we can get this much reviews. And it looked like so legit, like he was actually buying fertilizer from Etsy when in reality it's a class A drug that makes you trip out of your mind. It's so genius and nobody can actually stop it because how would you know that it's a drug? The Silk Road caught the attention of my curious 10 year old self, but it also caught the attention of the FBI. They launched a multi-year investigation involving multiple agencies around the globe to find this one single man. Turns out he was right here in the USA the entire time and he was making bread. In just a couple of years, his revenue was about 614,000 Bitcoin. Right now that would be over $18 billion. They launched a sting operation and had an undercover agent named Nob offer to buy the site from him. DPR, Dread Pirate Roberts, declines the offer but they continue talking and he actually became good friends with an FBI agent. That was the first mistake that he ever made. This actually reminds me of a time where a lawyer told me to be very very cautious of the friends that I make online. He said that since I'm a YouTuber, there's a higher or above normal chance that a federal agent would try to act like my friend and set me up just to see what was really going on behind the scenes and now I see why. This stuff actually happens. There was a rumor going around that the real IP address of the Silk Road would actually leak for just a few seconds a day because of some sort of misconfiguration and that actually was the case. The FBI ended up finding out where the server was located and it turns out to be somewhere located inside of Iceland. The FBI had their hands on this Iceland server and they could have shut it down within just a few seconds, but they knew that would have been a careless move. If they busted the doors down, destroyed the whole server rack and shut down the Silk Road, all the owner would have to do was just take a backup of the server, place it on a server in Mexico or some random country like Venezuela and boom, he's back up. Now the FBI has to go bouncing around from, from country to country and they're never going to find out who the owner was because of this ineffective cat and mouse game. So what they did was they waited. DPR didn't know the FBI was there the whole time intercepting all IP traffic, but all the FBI needed was for him to leak his real IP address just one time and his life was over. They can find out exactly which city, state, exact coordinates that he was from to know who was behind the Silk Road the entire time. But the owner of the Silk Road knew that as well. So he would never connect to his own server without a VPN or so he thought when he accidentally slipped one time and connected from a cafe in San Francisco, California. They're on time. They knew exactly where he was from because of that one IP address slip up. And now it's like they're so close to finding out where he is. It's only a matter of days at this point. Meanwhile, he makes such a good acquaintance with the FBI agent that he trusts him enough to ask the FBI agent, who he thought was a regular cartel guy, to end somebody's life for him. He's like, look bro, I'll pay you 80K in Bitcoin, so 40K now, 40K after the hit is done. I need you to waste 
my friend that went rogue and stole a bunch of money from me on the Silk Road. And then the FBI agent was like, yeah, sure, bro, I got you. Just tell me where he lives. So they made an agreement on 80K. The FBI actually went to the guy's house and he's like, look, we either put you in prison for being a part of the Silk Road or you work with us and give us all the information on DPR and we'll make it seem like we killed you. He's like, okay, I'm so down. And he actually complied. So the FBI, believe it or not, sends back an image to DPR um, showing the, a tortured, destroyed, violent version of his friend's face, totally cut up with scratches, like looked like he was totally wasted, saying, here, pay up the, uh, the other 40K because now your friend is dead. And he actually believed it and paid up. When the entire world is chasing you down, how could you make such a dumb mistake and leak your real IP address? And in reality, I feel like he didn't do it purposely. Sometimes some VPN companies actually mask your IP address, that's true. But when the government asks them to hand over the data that they have, they kind of have to. So when a VPN company actually keeps logs, they're forced to give it over to Big Brother, which is something that could never happen with today's sponsor, Private Internet Access. That was a smooth transition. Let's go, baby. A VPN is your secure tunnel to the internet, and without one is like being a celebrity in public without any bodyguards. People can track your IP address back to your real location and find out which city you're in instantly. You can spoof your location to any state or country to get access to geo-restricted content. For an example, you know that Netflix actually has a different catalog of shows depending on which country country you're in, but with PIA you can unlock all of them. They've also finally removed the cap from 10 devices at a time per account to unlimited devices per account. That means every single device in your household is protected from prying eyes of your ISP, hackers, network admins, and even Big Brother. PIA never stores any logs of your data, and in the case that any government agency asks them for it, they have nothing to show. This is proven in court multiple times. Protect unlimited devices with private internet access by using the link in the pinned comment down below. You'll get 83% off that equals two years and four months free or $2.03 per month. That's actually their lowest price yet. Get the VPN that I actually use and have turned on right now today. So now they have this IP address of a cafe in San Francisco, but they don't know who was behind it. They know that the login was made by somebody named Frosty, but that could be anybody inside that cafe shop. They scoured the entire internet to find a post from anybody that was going by Frosty, and they actually found somebody asking for coding help on Stack Overflow, saying, how can I connect to a Tor hidden service using curl and PHP? Then left his real email address at the bottom of the post that was his real first and last name. Ross Ulbricht. Got it. Rookie mistake. Ross Ulbricht also had his LinkedIn set to public where he talked about creating a marketplace free from government intervention. That is like enough evidence to verify this is the guy at the coffee shop. He's guaranteed the owner. We actually got him case closed, but not quite. But if you've ever seen any FBI bust, they only go in for a raid when they have 100% empirical concrete evidence. There can be absolutely no trace or room for interpretation or reason whatsoever. And still, that wasn't enough data. Now, this is where the story gets crazy because the FBI knew without having Ross's computer in their possession open and unlocked, they could not prove that he was guilty. But Ross also knew that. So the FBI suspected that his computers and laptops were all actually fully encrypted. And without the password, listen very closely, without the password, even if they raided his house, took all of his hard drives, computers, everything, they would not get a single piece of data unless they had his encryption key. That is crazy. Now they have to use some big brain plays like it's straight out of Death Note to find out how we can get access to his laptop while it's still open and unlocked. That's so, oh my God, this story's gonna get nuts right now. They know that he likes this cafe shop and usually brings his laptop to do some work. So they set up a bunch of FBI agents to be regular people that go in, buy a coffee and do some college work. And they set one up all over the place so that he was always close by. Now, finally, Ross walks into the cafe shop holding his laptop with all the data there. He looks around, finds no open seats and exits and enters the library right next door to the cafe shop in San Francisco. Now the FBI suspected that this would happen, so they actually already locked down the library with agents that seemed to be regular people, just students studying, you know, all the normal stuff. And they scattered them around every single table so that Ross was always at an arm's reach away. So wherever he sits, he was always by an agent. He sits down, 
opens his laptop, logs into the Silk Road, and in these next few seconds were the most crucial moments of his life. This 29-year-old entrepreneur was having a normal day just like anybody else, probably thinking, hmm, what am I going to eat after I finish work? Or should I make a plan with my friends to go hang out after I finish doing some of this stuff? But that life was damn near its demise. The federal agents thought, we need his laptop while it's open. If he suspects even for one second that we're onto him, he just taps one button on his keyboard and it's over for us. He fully encrypts his machines, doesn't leave his house, and we cannot fully verify that he's currently the owner of the Silk Road, even though it kind of seems like it. So they had to use a lot more manipulation to actually keep it open in front of him, and this was nuts. The federal agents orchestrated a social engineering attack. The exact definition is a manipulation technique that exploits human error to gain private information by luring unsuspected users to exposing data, spreading malware or infections, and getting access to restricted systems. And that's exactly what they did here. Listen very attentively, this was the biggest brain play I have ever seen in my life. They actually set up a fight between two people right behind Ross Ulbricht. They were shouting, getting in each other's faces until they were just about to scrap and get physical. And this caught the attention of the Dread Pirate Roberts as he was working on his laptop, so unsuspecting, in this quiet library. He made the biggest mistake of his entire life. When the people were fighting right behind him, he turned his head. He took his eyes off of his laptop and it was over for him. Agents stormed in from every single angle, some detaining him and arresting him, some holding back his laptop and keeping it active so it doesn't auto-lock so they can save all the data when it's unencrypted right in front of their eyes, and believe it or not, he just sat there in defeat. Ross didn't even fight back, he just sat there in awe, knowing that it's over for him. Every friend, every plan, every dream, every goal was done for life. Him turning his head away from his computer costed him a life in prison. With such cold hard evidence, no lawyer in the world could have saved him, not even his own. His lawyer made up something along the lines of, uh, just paraphrasing, Ross made the platform but then sold it very early on and the operation is currently ran by somebody else, not him. Which honestly is the greatest excuse that anybody could have came up with and it probably would have saved him a lot of time from prison if it wasn't for that laptop maneuver. But when the judge was presented with all this data, all this empirical cold hard facts, IP addresses, connecting, logs, and even Ross kept a diary of everything that he did, A to Z. He documented and tracked every single step that he took to build and maintain the Silk Road. So after the judge saw all this, he's like, no way. And he actually sentenced him in only a few hours of looking at this data to two life sentences plus 40 years in prison. Basically a smack in the face, like from every single angle saying, not only are you going to prison, but you're going to prison so hard you can never ever fight or get out. And honestly, it was a very controversial move because people think, shouldn't you only pay the price for what you did wrong? The judge made such a hard punishment because the judge was worried that somebody else might get inspired by what he did and then kind of be his successor or lead up after that. But don't you only pay the price for what you did wrong and you only pay for your own sins? Why is he doing prison for something somebody else in the future might do? Like Ross right now is 39 years old and he still has hope that he might be a free man one day, but he's probably never going to be. Like there were some rumors that Donald Trump was going to pardon him. It never ended up happening, but it seems like he's going to be in there forever. Do you think that punishment was fair or not? Why is he getting punished for some theoretical successor that doesn't even exist. And if we load up the Silk Road on the dark web using Tor browser, this is exactly what it looks like right now. This website has been seized, which is actually what inspired this hoodie that I'm wearing right now that's actually super limited and I'm only, I only carry about 30 left in stock. So if you want to grab one before they're gone, they're at iamlucid.com. I literally only have three zero left in stock and they're gone forever. Be totally honest with me and let me know what you think. Aside from all political correctness in the comments down below, I want to see your stance on this, especially if you're a lawyer. Please enlighten all of us. Was Ross Ulbricht's punishment too harsh or was it justified? Two life sentences plus 40 years in prison for a 29 year old that coded a Silk Road drug marketplace that moved dope around the world and also might have inspired somebody else to do the same, may or may not have, and he also thought that he hired a hit on somebody but it never actually happened. I feel like these two were too hypothetical and subjective where you only had evidence for one of them. 
What's your stance on this? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you all for watching this video. I love you. Stay dreaming. Stay lucid. I'm out. Peace.